do the first class for our Design of Concrete Structures course. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to kind of talk about the, the flow of the lessons that will be coming through this course, and then we'll get into a little bit of history and kind of the arrangement of what topics we'll be dealing with. Now, the textbook that this course will be referencing back to is Design of Concrete Structures by Darwin Dolan and Nielsen, the 15th edition. All right, and it looks something kind of like that. I'll zoom this out a little bit. So this will be the textbook that we'll be using. Okay, and so a lot of the chapter references that you'll see in the coming in the coming sections will be related to that. Okay. All right. All right. So the basics that we're going to start out with is kind of talking about the, some of the terminology and terms that will be used repeatedly in this class. And so we started our discussion with just a simple, a basic simple structure, okay, that in a typical reinforced concrete frame, you may have something, a structure that looks something kind of like this. This is a multiple portal, multiple story type of building, okay, and the basic elements that come with a reinforced concrete structure include the following items. Okay, obviously at the ground level, which you see down here at the bottom, we have um, our, our basic footing. This is usually what's attached to the columns. Obviously the columns then come up, and so a column is defined as a vertical member that will connect different elements together and then connect those elements back down to the foundation. Beams and girders will go between the columns, connecting that way, and then almost exclusively on top of these beams or girders will sometimes have a slab, okay, which is a smaller, thin element. And slabs can be a little bit tricky in that they can behave with moments in one direction or in two directions. For this course, we're going to focus mostly on one directional slabs, but we'll explain that more when we get to those, those particular elements here in a couple of lessons from now. Okay, the basic textbook that I just showed you, the Darwin textbook, is lined up as follows. Okay, so in order to be able to design these elements, there are a couple things that we have to do to set up first. We've got to understand the materials, okay? And then, of course, the building code. We'll be using ACI 318, uh, the 2019 edition, as our, as our reference, and the notes are calibrated for that. There are some references back to the 14, but those are typically in places where changes haven't been made between the two versions. But we'll be dealing with uh, the building code and commentary. Uh, for the, the 2019, okay? Um, in our textbook, the basic design philosophy, those are basically located in chapters two and three, okay? Looking at the elements that we have, okay, we're gonna be looking at doing, um, we'll start off with flexure and shear design uh, of beams. Uh, we'll be doing singly reinforced and doubly reinforced. You'll find those down in chapter four and five, okay? And then we'll move into kind of the interaction. Because concrete is, um, a function of two materials, it's, you know, concrete being reinforced with some sort of steel material, um, we have to be able to understand the the bond that exists between those two. Now, in some undergraduate classes, they choose not to talk a lot about this bond or developmental length, but in my opinion, it's pretty important, and it looks like Darwin agrees because he throws this content into chapter six, and so we'll talk about some of those. Now, there we will not do nearly enough justice to the study of bond or developmental length or transfer length or anything like that, but it is an important idea to be at least be aware of, and we'll work some problems and some details according to the ACI specifications in that area. Okay, and then once we've gotten through chapter six, we should be in great shape to be able to analyze, you know, any beam or slab, whether it's doubly reinforced or whether it's a T-beam or singly reinforced or a one-way slab, we should be good to go. So once we get to that point. Okay, all right. Once we get past that, okay, in an RC frame, you know, beams and slabs are seldom simply supported. Okay, in fact, they're actually continuous. So we'll be looking at some of the effects of continuity in chapter 12. Okay, um, another major force um, besides flexion shear is obviously compression. This will work for columns. Okay, and we're going to start off with concentrically loaded columns. This will be studied in chapters 9 and 10. Okay, but again, you know, we're starting off with the simple structures, you know, since columns are often, you know, affected by not only just axial load, but also moments in one or two directions, okay, we need to be able to handle eccentrically loaded columns, and there's materials there, so um, we'll be able to do that, dealing with the, the text of chapter 10, and we'll be making interaction diagrams for, to be able to establish our understanding for, for the behavior of columns on those, okay. Okay, 
um, some more material that we'll kind of cross paths with or kind of have to do with um, designing for footings and retaining walls. We won't do a whole lot in this area, but that material is located down in chapter 15. Uh, this is typically the interaction between concrete and some sort of soil. Retaining walls are structures that hold back, you know, higher elevations of soil and other loads. Okay, and there's some special requirements that we have to kind of keep in mind as we do this. Now, this is not a foundations design class. Okay, but so we'll do things kind of the ACI way. This may be different than what you see in a geotechnical engineering or a foundations class, but it will give you a good framework for when you get to those in, in, your, in your careers. Okay, and that will be chapter 15 where that shows up. Um, chapter 14, we start to talk a little bit about some more uh, complicated structural systems. Again, this is an undergraduate level class, so we don't do a lot with this, but we start talking about the, the kind of the interaction between slabs and columns and slabs and beams and beams and columns, okay? Uh, this will be most evident um, in topics involving uh, two-way design of, uh, of slabs because of a phenomenon known as punching shear. Um, again, we may not do a whole lot in this particular series, but eventually I hope to have some lessons up that will cover that material as well. And then we get into some more complex structures such as stairways, uh, foundation designs, whether it's a, you know, a simple spread footing or whether it's some sort of strip footing or a wall footing, such as what you would see under this underneath a wall. We'll get into a little bit of wall design or we'll talk about the behaviors or implications of wall behavior on structural systems as well. Okay, so this is kind of this kind of a, a picture kind of outlining some of the different terms and different pieces that you'll see. All right. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So that's kind of the, the breakdown of the book. Okay, now to start off our discussion, we need to kind of understand what the basic concept of reinforced concrete is. Now, if you've watched the, the previous video on this, we kind of ran you through, you know, the last, you know, eight or 10,000 years in the history of concrete and its evolution from what was kind of a, a natural cement kind of structure, grout based kind of coating to the more modern day, you know, structural systems with reinforcing and those kind of things, all right? Um, typically, the Egyptians and the Romans are credited with the most uh, most advancement in those areas. Um, highways that the Romans made are, you know, 2,000 years ago are still being used today. Um, I've actually walked on a couple of sections of those on a trip to Italy a couple of years ago. It's pretty cool. That I mean, they're very well worn, but they're still, still in use, okay? Um, they're, they're not as smooth and... Uh, as you know what we would picture a concrete pavement on an interstate highway in the United States, but They're they're functional for what they are trying to get a horse and a carriage across those it works pretty well Okay um, In 1824 Joseph Aspidin was the first one to Contact um, or to obtain a patent for the manufacture of Portland cement which becomes the modern-day binding agent um, in one of the most more important materials in reinforced concrete Okay and so with him using Portland cement, sand, and aggregate, modern concrete was formed, okay? This was coming out of an era where, you know, the, of the dark ages where they thought, hey, you know, the recipe was just kind of vanished for a while. You know, they kind of forgot how they did, and they did it, and I'm not exactly sure why that was, but, you know, eventually they kind of came back around, and so this was the evolution, one of the biggest jumping points for making concrete a useful modern day material was, was accomplished nearly 200 years ago. Okay. Um, the first person to actually put steel to strengthen concrete was Joseph Monnier in 1857. He was a French gardener and okay, he was trying to make flower pots and um, he was using concrete to do that and was using steel to kind of help hold things together. Okay. Now he did try to put, um, you know, he used this to, you know, to make pipes and, you know, arches and slabs, but it's, you know, it's interesting to note that his reinforced concrete slab was not successful, okay, because of the location of where the steel was, okay, there just wasn't the understanding of stress distribution. So this class is going to focus a lot on drawing strain diagrams and understanding where stresses occur, and then with that logic, we'll be armed with the material that we need to be able to understand where the stresses um, are the maximum, you know, kind of a brief example of what he did. He put the reinforcing at the middle of the slab. And so if we have a flexural element as shown here, we know that the stress is very linearly because remember sigma is equal to minus my over i is the basic formula for stress. Okay. And so he was putting his steel at the middle of this. Well, y is measured from the middle. We measure y from this location. So that's a positive y direction. And so when we do that, 
the, you know, obviously he put it at a location where stress was very low. He was placing his steel here. Okay, but once we understand the stress diagrams, we know that it's, you know, if concrete is very good in compression, which we'll talk about, there's a minus here and there's a positive here, then it makes more sense to put the steel somewhere toward the bottom for a flexural diagram that looks like this. And this will become the basis for how we decide, you know, for, you know, especially for continuous beams where my maximum positive stresses can occur either at the bottom or the top, depending on the structure. This starts to dictate where I put reinforcing, and so we can start to do some things with that. So this becomes a very, very critical thought process in the design of concrete. It's probably a little bit—it's a little bit different than you might have seen in a steel class, but for concrete, it's very, very important that we do that. Okay, okay. Now, as we said, you know, concrete is very, very strong in compression. This was evidenced by the use of concrete in in the Roman arches. Okay, but if we use it alone in flexure without any sort of reinforcing, okay, a, you know, such as in a beam, this beam will fail at a very low load, which is governed by the tensile strength of the concrete. Okay, we've got to have steel in the tensile regions, right? And so there are three, and so being able to predict what this tensile strength of concrete is becomes fundamental in both not only flexure, but also in the design for shear. And we'll show you, we'll walk you through either here in the next coming episodes, the, some of the tests that we have to do to um, that we have available for predicting tensile stresses and depending on how it's loaded we get different equations or different values now if i take a member and subject it to just pure tension it has one strength if i subject it to flexure the tensile stresses have another okay and then we have another one which is called a split cylinder which is you know i push in one direction and then it's a transverse crack that occurs all of these become kind of important characteristics of any mixed design now this class isn't going to focus on you know, proportioning of, you know, components in the mix, but we will be talking about, you know, some of the, some of the basic characteristics of it, this, you know, because you've got to kind of understand what's going on there. So we'll talk about that in the next lesson. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about cracking, which is kind of a serviceability criteria, because obviously by putting steel inside of concrete, steel is very susceptible to weathering, whether it's, you know, moisture or air or chloride attacks. So cracking become conduits to allow water and chlorine to get into the interior portions of a beam and if we corrode our steel then the strength of the beam overall is very very significantly impacted so we want to make sure that we understand some of the characteristics for how cracking was considered and we'll be looking at it, some some older techniques for approximating crack widths that may or may not be valid in today's code but they still give you a good estimate <clears throat> of how cracking is is um, is anticipated or how it's evaluated as far as the structure, okay, and then we'll talk about you know, what can we do to control cracking, and that becomes a major issue for you know our bar selection and our placement of the steel. So we're constantly coming back to these these other characteristics that we never had to consider in our steel design classes, okay. So the basic premise of what reinforced concrete design is is that we want to be able to utilize the high compressive strength of concrete and the very high tensile strength of steel and together we can start to put them together to resist an external moment okay and that's what we call the internal couple concept and so when we start looking at this we'll be doing something called a whitney stress block which helps us draw the picture for this internal couple and with that the, the design and analysis of concrete beams becomes very 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 simple and very very straightforward but you know going back to what we had before here's our stress diagram for a flexural member we're expecting high compressive stresses here. Again, this is for a simply supported beam. And then we're looking at very high tensile stresses in the steel here. And what will happen is we will neglect the concrete in, 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 in the tensile capacity of the concrete, which is kind of a conservative, conservative estimate as we start to look at that. Okay, now, what are some of the advantages or the pros and cons of reinforced concrete? Okay, some of the advantages are that we can get very high strengths in our concrete material. So there's a wide range of it. Um, typically, most normal concrete is in the range of 3,000 or 4,000 PSI. You'll see 4,000 is probably the most common for, for evaluating. Uh, 3,000 is, is, is pretty useful in situations such as foundations where I just need weight and mass rather than actual strength. But, you know, you start getting into slender structures or precasting, and you can see high strength concrete in the areas of eight to 10,000 PSI. When I was working on my master's degree, we were dealing with F prime C's that were well over 10,000 PSI and studying shear effects. And we'll talk about kind of the implications of your concrete strength on 
different factors, all right? Um, we're, we'll also be able to deal with a wide range of steel stresses. And so you can see concrete is in the range of 3,000 to 8,000, but steel goes anywhere from 40 to 80. Now, the most common that we'll use is 60 KSI, but we'll be working calculations with 40 as also just to understand the ACI requirements. Okay. Okay, another advantage of reinforced concrete is, is the formability, and we talked about this in the last video, okay, is that you can make any shape out of concrete because concrete is molded when it's in a, in a semi-liquid state. It kind of flows, and so we can do round shapes very, very easily, a lot more uh, simply than, you know, the steel counterparts, okay. Concrete is also very high in fire resistance, okay, we can get to a one to three hour rating without any sort of fireproofing, whereas steel, you have to have some sort of spray on coating to be able to achieve these numbers. So it's very, very resistant to fire. Okay, it's also high mass. So um, provides, you know, high rigidity and high mass. Okay, which this will help with vibrations and seismic. Okay, in fact, in a lot of high seismic areas, structures are commonly, the main resisting system is commonly some sort of structural shear wall system or structural moment frame that's all made out of concrete. Um, steel structures just don't, don't behave as well under vibrations. Okay. The, um, the available the materials, you know, worldwide, um, we can we can come up with materials even in remote areas, areas like the Middle East or down on the Caribbean islands. We you know concrete materials are readily available, whereas steel may be a premium or maybe harder to obtain. So that's definitely an advantage in, in you know some of those some of those locations. We talked a little bit about the weather resistance. If we pay attention to cracking, okay, they, they weather very, very well. I mean, like I was saying, that Roman highway that I walked on several years ago is still in existence today, okay? Um, the low cost, now this number may not be exactly valid, but you know, we're looking 200 to $300 per cubic yard in place. You know, so the material cost is very, very low as compared to steel that may be you know, $1.50, $2 a pound. Now, this doesn't include the placement cost, and this doesn't necessarily include the cost of the formwork, which that can be a huge factor here, okay? And then if performed correctly, uh, concrete is very low maintenance, okay? I don't have to continually go back and repaint in order to protect it from the weathering resistance, okay? And, you know, certain mixed designs are very, very durable, and so it's, it's a very positive advantage for, for us there that we have a low maintenance issue. Okay, now some of the disadvantages are, you know, as we showed, the concrete strength is a very low strength per unit weight. Okay, that we're looking at, you know, somewhere the FRMC is somewhere from 0 0.5 to 0 0.1 of FY. It's, you know, very, very low. Okay, and, you know, whereas, you know, the, the specific weight of concrete may be something like 0 0.3, the specific weight of steel is something significantly more. Okay, so concrete is not useful for very long span structures such as bridges. Now, we can kind of get around this a little bit if we go into the realm of pre-stressing. Okay, that I can get a lot more strength, you know, in both in flexure and in shear by adding pretension cables. Now, this class won't talk a whole lot about pre-stressing. We may mention it a little bit in one of the later episodes, but we won't get into the design and the considerations of that. That's more of a graduate school level topic. And again, maybe eventually we'll get some videos up on that, but for this course, we won't be dealing with pre-stressing. Okay, um, the cracking characteristics for steel, um, the cracking occurs at very low stresses on the neighborhood of 250 to 400 PSI. Now again, compare that to our you know, 3,000, 8,000 PSI compressive stress. That's a very, very, very low value. So in the problem with concrete is we kind of as we kind of joke around a lot is is that we we talk about you know that you know concrete by nature is going to crack at some point so this ability to control these cracks as we mentioned you know you know cracking can become unsightly we can have leaking or dis discoloration and then even more crucially is the corrosion of steel okay so one of the things that we can do for to control cracking is we can deal with pre-stressed concrete Okay, and that can help us with these cracking stresses as well, that we can preload the concrete so that it has to undercome, overcome a pre-compression, and then we have to overcome the limit for the, for the, for the, for the tensile stresses as well. Okay, um, quality control of the concrete is relatively hard to, uh, to accompl accomplish, especially in some of the more remote areas. Now, in, you know, Countries like the U.S., where we we have you know ready mixed concrete plants, you know, 
all over the place. You know, we can control the apportioning of concrete, whether it's the quantity of water or the concrete of the, the aggregates. We can we can predict the the strengths fairly fairly well. Okay, but the problem is is that once it leaves the plant on the on the mixer truck and it gets to the site, a common occurrence is that, that to enable better workability to be able to place it, sometimes the the drivers or the, the, the folks that are installing the concrete on the site may they may do something like adding water to it. Well adding water can reduce the strength of the concrete. So we've got to be very pay very careful attention to what we call the WC ratio, which is the water to cementitious material ratio. There's an optimum point on this curve in which it's kind of, you know, this parabolic curve like that, and there's a sweet spot. And if I plot W over C and I look at F prime C, I get a strength correlation like that. So if I add water, what I'm doing is I'm marching to the right. So if I'm to the left of that optimum point, I get stronger. But if we're out here and we get too carried away with the water, I can actually start stealing a lot of the strength associated with that. So quality control of concrete is very, very critical of those. It's why we have testing protocols. It's why we do things like cylinder tests, you know, on a regular basis, you know, you know. The other issue is, is that concrete takes a while to cure to reach its full hardened strength. You know, if I place it on day one, you know, F prime C, this value up here, isn't evaluated until 28 days. Well, in some industries, such as the precast industry, I want a high F prime C early on, you know, so that I can, you know, pour my beam and then release the stress and then set up for the next pour, you know, immediately. You know, we're in the business of building these precast elements. And so, so quality control and some tricks that we do with that will be, will be a, you know, a major consideration for a lot of those guys in the construction and placement areas. Um, we mentioned a disadvantage about the cost of forms and shoring for, for cast in place. Okay, you've got extra labor and extra material. And like I say, a good rule of thumb is, is whatever you pay for the material of the concrete, double it for the form work and the material. Just kind of as a quick, rough guesstimate on those. Okay, and then perhaps one of the biggest factors that we have is the time-dependent volume changes. Okay, concrete experiences something known as creep and shrinkage. Okay, which change the strains of the member just by under a given uh, a given load that's sustained, such as the dead load, and then deflection or cracking can be caused by a shrinkage, which is kind of a moisture-related evaporation process, and then creep is an excessive deflection that deflections increase over time up to a certain limit, but they don't occur immediately. Okay, and so so older concrete structures behave a little bit different than than current concrete structures, you know, newly placed ones, and so we'll have to kind of take a look at some issues like that. So that kind of gives you kind of a, a kind of some ideas of some of the pros and cons of reinforced concrete and you know, some of the potential remedies for a lot of some of these disadvantages. You can see that pre-stress and pre-cast kind of go hand in hand, that those become, you know, very, very significant for improving the behavior of concrete and becoming more viable in our particular design. So we'll stop there for now. Um, I hope this kind of gives you kind of a brief rundown of some of the history that we've talked about, um, some of the, the, the way that this, this class will be set up as far as the textbook goes, and then, of course, the advantages and disadvantages. So the, these advantages and disadvantages are always foremost on our mind as we're doing our structural engineering with, related, with relations to concrete. Okay, so for the next time, we'll be talking more about the basic concepts of reinforced concrete Okay, and more specifically, we'll be getting into our material properties, and then we'll even start talking a little bit about creep and shrinkage effects. Okay, and we will go from there. So thank you for watching, and have a great day.